Are you ready to revolutionize your approach to school leadership? Imagine a world where you can drive academic performance while also simultaneously building a thriving school culture. Because in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to harness the power of looking at data to improve your school or your district. We're also gonna think about how we use that to make us a better educational leader and also to build a great school community. Grab a pen, a piece of paper, and get ready to take some notes because we're going to start right now. Hey, everybody. Gordon Emerson here, Superintendent of Schools and Gallup Certified Strengths Coach. And on this channel, we leverage my experience from classroom teacher to school district superintendent to help you go further faster in your educational journey. If this is your first time with us, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so you don't miss any cool updates or any of our latest episodes. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are now in session three of our three-part series on the must-dos of educational leadership. And we've been hard at work trying to uncover and unpack for you what we think are those best practices, those essential skills, essential talents, but also some concrete activities, some concrete tools that you could use as you think about how do I lead my school better? How do I inspire people? How do I create that environment of nurturing, of growth, of passion, passion for learning, passion for growth? And we want to build that, we want to build that passion for learning and that passion for growth, not only in our scholars, but also in our educators and staff as well. And so when we think about leadership, leadership is this opportunity to explore those things, to create that environment, to create that culture that will be so beneficial for so many people in and around our school communities. So today, we want to talk more specifically about how do we use data, statistics, points of information, to help to drive effective decisions. And data can be massive. It can be lots of information and it can become overwhelming and it can become cumbersome. So what we wanna give you today are just some things to think about and some very concrete specific strategies of how to use that data to not only feel more confident about the decisions that you make, but also to put forth the best ideas, to put forth the best possible options and opportunities for the people who we serve. And so with that, let's jump right in to strategy number one. All right, let's talk about strategy number one. So the first thing you wanna think about is being sure that you can understand the different types of data that are available to you as a school or district leader. And this is not gonna be new, but let's just talk about some examples. You'll have academic performance data. You'll have attendance data, behavioral data. You'll have financial data. You'll have data that will come back from utilization from certain types of programs or software or applications that you use. All of these data points are important, but there's also additional data points, for instance, from surveys, as you survey parents, as you survey students, as you survey staff. But all of these pieces, all these components of data help to create these pictures, these composites, if you will, of the different things that are going on in your school or in your organization. And we as leaders have to think about how do we take this data and how do we go through and analyze and deconstruct it to then make and draw some conclusions about where we go next. So here, the data is telling us this has already happened. Here are these data points, and here's what we can learn from that. And then from that process and from that analysis, where do we need to now go from here and into the future? And I think that when we understand that that's the power that data provides us, I think we're in a really good place. Another key type of data, because a lot of times we get kind of stuck only on the numbers, only on the numbers. And surveys get it a little bit, but I'll, I'll go even further. The quantitative data that you see in 
assessment and performance data, you get from attendance data that you may get from financial data. Those numbers are important. That survey data and also any type of anecdotal kind of interview data that you can get, the qualitative data is critically important because I truly believe that the lived experience, what people are going through and what people are willing to share about how they have gone through a process, what they have seen, what they have experienced, when you take that data and add it on top of those statistics, those numbers, those data points on the chart, you get a deeper, more holistic and comprehensive picture of what's happening in your organization. And now, you're strategically positioned to make that much better of a decision. So let's talk about a concrete strategy that you can use as you go through and do this process of leading your school or leading your organizations. And so that concrete strategy is to conduct a data audit. And so how do you create that data audit? Well, the very first thing is you wanna make sure you identify all those sources of data that are available to you. I think taking a, taking stock and getting that information and making sure that you've organized it, you understand what you're looking at, but making sure you identify comprehensively what all those sources of data are because you want to make sure you have everything at your fingertips and within your ability to analyze so you can make informed decisions. Additionally, you want to then categorize that data, categorize it into academic data, behavioral data, attendance data et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But making sure you nest it properly into the appropriate category to make sure that you have the right context, you have the right perspective as you look at that data is important as well. Then you wanna assess the quality and the relevance of that data. Like, is it from a reputable source? Is the data clean? Is the data, we'll talk about relevant, am I looking at data from last year? Am I looking at data from three years ago? Am I looking at data from five to seven or 10 years ago? Making sure that we assess its quality and its relevance is important as well. And then we wanna create an inventory document because the most important part of this process is after we've brought all this information together, all, after we've gotten access to all of it, we wanna make sure that we have an effective protocol, an effective process by which we can go through and analyze it. Because the key to this, the X factor is, you cannot conduct the data audit by yourself. You are the decision maker in many cases, but you want to bring more people in because you want to have different perspectives. You want to have different lenses. You want to have different experiences going through and looking at that data so that way you're getting a holistic review from all the different levels within the organization. But you need to have a protocol and a document or an inventory sheet that helps you to go through and do that process effectively. And then lastly, you've got to share the data. After you've done the analysis, after you've done the audit process, you have to share that data far and wide with your stakeholders. You want to tell them what you've learned. You want to communicate what you now know better and different after having gone through that entire comprehensive process. You also want to share who was involved in that process of meaning making with you. Who were those stakeholders? Who were those folks that helped to contribute to this new baseline set of knowledge? Share that information as well. And then the last thing that you wanna to do to come full circle on the audit is you wanna to continue to ask for feedback. Above and beyond just the small group that you worked with, but above and beyond that, now that you've made, that, now you've made new meaning, share that out with the bigger group, with your entire school community get their feedback, gather their feedback, and then make a commitment to circle back to that data audit and look at it again. And one final tip that I think is really, really important is to make sure that you create some sort of a cycle where you're updating, revising, and revisiting the data audit, the data that you're looking at, the data that you're relying on, create a cycle of inquiry. Don't just do, don't make this mistake. Don't just do a data audit once. It has to become a part of your leadership cycle of inquiry where we're making new decisions. We're making additional decisions because we continually are going through the process of continuous improvement. And really at the core, the data audit is just a commitment to continuous improvement. Looking at the data, looking at the lived experience, making meaning of it, coming up with new ideas, 
coming up with new strategies, coming up with new directions and initiatives, asking our folks for feedback and going through that cycle over and over and over again. All right. So make sure you understand the types of data available to you. Make sure you conduct that data audit and make sure that you build it into your leadership cycle of inquiry, focus on continuous improvement. And that's strategy number one. All right, let's talk about strategy number two. And strategy number two, when we think about how to create that rich environment around looking at data, analyzing data and using it to drive decision making, we want to be able to do a series of data analysis techniques targeted for us as school leaders. We want to be able to understand different types of issues and different types of things that are happening within our schools and using data will help to do that. So sometimes we have to engage in trend analysis, what's been happening over the last several years. Sometimes there's an issue where we might need to make some coronate, cor coronation, not coronation, some correlation analysis. If this, then that. So this is happening, so maybe this is why. But doing that correlation analysis is another activity or never another technique that we would need to employ. And then another one I think is really important is root cause analysis, trying to get at the core, trying to get underneath why something is happening. But these are the various ways that we as leaders look at data because not because just looking at data, but not having a technique or way of trying to make meaning of that data, we will just be overwhelmed. Again, as I stated earlier in this session, there's tons of data, there's tons of information, but unless we put on the, like the proper lens, the proper perspective, unless we kind of prime ourselves to look at the data through a very specific purpose process or protocol, we can get lost. And so let's talk about a very specific strategy that we as school leaders often employ. So a concrete strategy that can really help us put into specific practice implementing a strategy of how to look at data effectively as a school leader would be to conduct a root cause analysis. So the very first thing you want to do in a root cause analysis is to identify a problem of practice or identify a current trend or issue that you may be concerned about. So in this example, let's talk about underperformance and mathematics. So now we've ident that's step one. We've identified a challenge, an issue, or problem we want to further explore. And then step two, we need to look into, let's identify the relevant data or metrics of what may be able to give us an explanation or start to walk us through why we are experiencing this challenge. So in this particular case, if we have underperformance in mathematics. Let's look at student performance data. Let's look at student demographic data. Let's look at teacher instructional practice data. Let's look at software utilization data, if we're using specific initiatives, specific applications, specific programs. Let's look at curricular data that we may have access to. But once we've gathered that relevant data, we then move to strategy number three, which is let's apply a protocol to try to get at a deeper understanding of why these things may happen. So one example would be developing five whys. Now this is a specific t protocol where we go through and we identify Five whys student performance in mathematics may be lagging or may be underperforming. Go through that. That's a collaborative, very, very honest, very deep conversation that can happen amongst school leaders, amongst school stakeholders who have a vested interest in that process. But coming up with those five whys, reason one, here's why. Reason two, here's why et cetera, et cetera. But going through that meticulous process is gonna develop again this deeper understanding, which then thereby you can move to strategy or step number four. And step number four would be, all right, we have all of this, what's our action plan? What are the one to three new or different strategies? One to three new or different approaches? One to three different opportunities that we'll now explore in an effort to improve student performance in mathematics. But it's getting that specific. It's getting that detailed 
That's how we get to this at a deeper and deeper level. And then after that action plan, the number, you know, not number one, but very, very important, I would say, as leaders, we need to monitor that plan and we need to adjust that plan. Again, through that cycle of inquiry, that continuous improvement cycle, we need to monitor and then we need to adjust. And as we see things that are going well, do more of that if it's gonna move us in the direction we wanna to go to. And if we are not seeing their performance, we're not seeing the changes that we're looking for, we need to be ready to adjust. As leaders, we are given that opportunity, we are given the leverage, and we're also given the responsibility of making those changes when necessary. But going through a root cause analysis is a high level leadership strategy that we all should be engaged in. So before we move to strategy number three, talk to us and share in the comments below what types of root cause analysis have either you've experienced and gone through a process or a protocol similar to this, or what type of root cause analysis do you believe needs to be explored in your school or in your district right now? Share that with us in the comments below and we're gonna to move to strategy number three. All right, let's talk about strategy number three. And strategy number three is about creating a data-driven culture. I am I am always excited and always very, very motivated to talk about how we shape and build culture as school leaders. Because I think that at the end of the day, in many cases as, as leaders, uh, we have had to become more generalist in our approach. We're no longer the resident expert or the instructional expert or the budget expert or the student experience expert, but our job is really to build culture. So it's like, how do we leverage those folks and create the culture so those things can happen? And more specifically, when we start to talk about data, it's about shaping and creating a culture where people are excited about looking at data. So thinking about leaders who can create that type of environment will create schools and systems where there are high levels of engagement, high levels of satisfaction, and most importantly, high levels of student growth and performance. And so let's talk about ways to develop this culture around being data-driven. So the first thing I think about is how do we make a commitment to invest the time, the effort, and the energy in professional development and in professional learning for our staff? It's one thing to say, yes, we want you all to be lifelong learners. We want you all to make sure you are building your skills, your knowledge, and your capacity. But how are we creating as leaders the space and the time and making the financial commitments that are necessary to make sure our folks can have that. That is step number one, having a focus on making sure that professional development and learning is available for our folks. How do we then also expand our team's knowledge and expertise and capacity? Well, I think it's also bringing in experts. It's opening their doors and bringing in somebody who can help expand on that knowledge. Somebody who comes in who has the expertise, who has the knowledge, who has the context to be able to share that with us so that way we grow, we now expand our knowledge base and our experience and expertise. So creating a space for experts to come in, creating a space to bring in a consultant to share that information and share that data. And I know that this can cut both ways. Sometimes it can get a little bit challenging to bring experts in from the outside. And I think that that's where we as leaders who are committed to this type of work, we find that healthy balance. But what we can say definitively is not all the answers will always 100% of the time be found within our organization. And I think that's when it is incumbent upon us to look for opportunities to bring experts in to teach and to grow and to stretch us as lifelong learners. Additionally, making sure that we're hitting on the different modalities of the way that people learn. Adult learning theory is a thing. It's real. It's true. Adults need to go through the process of learning things and they need to experience it. It needs to be hands-on. It needs to be engaging. It needs to be inviting. It needs to hit on lots of different ways of tapping into our learning and our expertise and our levels of engagement. So whenever you wanna create that rich environment and that rich culture, be thinking as a leader, how am I gonna make this meaningful? How am I gonna make this engaging? 
I don't want people to sit and get all day long. I want to make sure that they're up and they're moving around and they're hands on and they're engaged in deep reflective conversations with their with their colleagues and they're engaged in deep and meaningful conversations with us as school leaders. So we're developing alignment. We're developing connection. We're developing relationships. We're developing trust. And when we have these rich opportunities for rich conversations that are hands on, that are focused on professional development, that's growing people's skills and knowledge. That's where we're going to build that thriving culture. And then making sure that, again, we create through all of those additional or those earlier steps, a community of practice around shared meaning, collaboration, critical conversation, vulnerability and trust. When we create that community, that community of practice that's focused on data and data analysis and developing best practice out of that that's a healthy, vibrant culture. And then lastly, as leaders, we have to make sure we provide that ongoing resource and support to those who need additional training, additional opportunities, additional resources. We as leaders, again, are given the responsibility of being able to leverage those resources, create those opportunities, and be able to design that for the best interest of our educators who are going to be the front line of doing that critically important work of the teaching and learning with our students and moving performance and moving the culture. But it's our job to shape that, create that, and create those opportunities. So we're always going to want to make sure that we're doing that as well. Creating that culture of learning, of commitments to professional development, creates this nice cycle of, of inquiry around what are the things that we want to make sure that we're able to do? Well, if we want to be a data-driven organization and make data-driven decisions, we have to make these commitments. And the three strategies that we've talked about in this session are critically important. You must do these things. Create ways to have data, out, uh, data audits. Create ways to do deeper analysis to get to the root cause of some of your challenges. But create a culture where people are open and ready to engage in those types of critically important professional conversations and professional endeavors. But this is stacking on to the other must do's that we've talked about in educational leadership. And so I want to remind you to go back and check out this episode that lays the foundation for this three part series, because it really kind of kicked off the idea and then check out the playlist for the must do's of educational leadership, because it's going to build in this multiple, it's a total of four, four uh, sessions, but these three videos really break out in a deeper way, the specific types of things that you should do that are those must do's, but gives you concrete scenarios and examples and activities that you can incorporate as well. We want to drive educational leadership through our opportunity to learn and grow together and build this community of leaders. Make sure that you continue to engage in best practice. Look for those opportunities to lead your staffs well. Build these into your repertoire. Build these into your expertise. Again, if you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so you don't miss any of the updates and any of the information that we're pro providing to you. And again, don't forget to check out this next video because it's going to lay the foundation for you. Check the description below for more information on coaching, mentoring, resources, our weekly newsletter that gives you educational leadership tips. And until the next time, we'll see you really, really soon. Take care of each other. Be well, everyone. Thanks.